what I have to say about Syria is um, premised on, on the same uh, general principles with regard to imperialism that, that Papal has, um, has, has spelled out in some detail. So um, I hope those can be, for the purpose of our, our two presentations today, those things can be uh, taken as read. Now, um, Papal has talked about the uh, aggression that the NATO powers are, are waging against Libya. One of the things that, one of the fig leaves or pretexts uh, that, that imperialism assembled in order to give some kind of spurious justification uh, to its launching of a war against Libya was to claim that was to claim the support uh, of the of the some of the other countries in the region uh, for, for what they were doing. So we were told that oh well we had to impose this no-fly zone because the Arab League, uh, for example, didn't work, was was demanding it. Now, when when this matter was discussed. Uh, in, in the Arab League, um, incidentally at a meeting to which a considerable number of Arab countries did not turn up at all, a meeting at which the representatives of the Libyan government were barred from attending, but when the Arab League discussed this matter, there were two countries uh, that took a stand in the Arab League against the moves against Libya uh, and, and voted against it, and those two countries were Syria and Algeria. Uh, so from that point of view alone, it's perhaps not surprising that the whole scenario that we have seen played out against Libya has very soon afterwards started to in turn be rolled out <coughs> against Syria. Now, the strategy and stages of this kind of destabilization process are or ought to be familiar um, to comrades by now. Um, they ought to be familiar um, because we have seen them not just in recent months over um, first Libya and, and, and now Syria, uh, but we've seen it over the recent years, particularly against Yugoslavia, against Iraq on more than one occasion, against Afghanistan uh, and so on, and indeed in West Africa against Sierra Leone and the Ivory Coast. Uh, but I have to say ought to be familiar because as Harpal has ex uh, highlighted in some detail, the people who have made themselves the self-appointed leaders of the anti-war movement in this country seem singularly able, uh, unable uh, to, to recognize these realities uh, when they stare them in the face. But in summary, you can say that imperialism has a kind of a script which reads roughly like this. The first step is to use grievances, both justified or unjustified, real or imaginary, among some sections of society to foment protests and demonstrations in a given country, to encourage terrorist actions not only against the police and security forces, but also against the general public and even against the anti-government protesters themselves, whilst all the time conducting a propaganda campaign in the media and elsewhere that all that is happening is peaceful protest against a supposedly dictatorial regime, to then present the government's legitimate response to such provocations in the most lurid and exaggerated um, terms, with every rumour and falsehood frequently invented by the imperialists themselves, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, presented as a fact, to then use the hysterical atmosphere thus created to impose sanctions on the country, both as a form of psychological warfare and also to impact on its economy by, for example, choking off trade credits and restricting access to the international banking system. system. And, and finally, finally launching an outright armed aggression against the victimized country using overwhelming military force, in particular aerial bombardment <coughs> of a type that constitutes nothing less than state terrorism, which is, uh, as, as we can see in the case of Libya, with or without the fig leaf of a resolution from a generally compliant United Nations Security Council. And it's this um, cynical scenario which we've seen played out in a kind of fast-forward motion, uh, it, one of the striking things, and I think it's a reflection of the imperialist crisis rather than their strength, is that a process that actually took a period of some years in Iraq, took just weeks in the case of, of Libya. But this process, which we've seen played out in the case of Libya, we see now taking place against Syria. And yet how many more examples do people need to have 
before we can say, well, you know, don't say that you weren't warned of what was likely um, to happen. Now, from the time that disturbances broke out in Syria in mid-March, uh, this manipulation, mis misrepresentation and lies um, could be discerned on the part of the imperialist mass media and some other mass media uh, outlets that were following in their, or in their wake. I want to um, give one example that appeared in the Financial Times this Wednesday. Now, the Financial Times is, you know, by the standards of the, the British press, a relatively serious publication. Uh, so, from that point of view, I'd like to say that this is, you know, that one is actually taking this example from the best possible source <laughs> rather, than, rather than the worst. If this is what the Financial Times uh, prints, then you can imagine what, what others are, are printing. But um, this article in the Financial Times on Wednesday dealt with the supposed discovery of, um, of mass, what they called mass graves in, in Syria. And the relevant paragraph <laughs> reads as follows. More reports also surfaced concerning what activists allege are mass graves in the area of the city of Dera. Abdul Halim Zubi, a Jordanian journalist with close links to the Dera area where protests began two months ago, said he had spoken to people who had seen the graves. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's just revisit this for a second. The reports surfaced. Which reports, from where did they surface? Concerning what activists allege, which activists allege, allege means what exactly in this, con uh, in this context. <coughs> and there we have a guy who is a Jordanian journalist. Now, I haven't looked this man up in Google or anywhere, but I suspect you won't find a great deal about him. I don't think he's a, a famous name uh, in journalism. But he has close links, sounds good, but what does it actually mean, to the Dera area. And what is the evidence of this effectively anonymous person, that he says, or at least according to the Financial Times he says, that he has spoken to people who have seen them. <laughs> now, if this, is, if this is evidence of an atrocity, then, you know, word, well, words are starting to fail me. But the point is that one... That, 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 that once these reports are published, they are, then they are then repeated in every single media outlet, they are repeated on the floor of the House of Commons, and, and so on and so forth, and they become taken as a fact. And before you know it, everybody, or more or less everybody, hopefully excluding the people in this room, take it as being a fact, uh, and consequences flow from that. It's on the basis of, the, of these reports that then, that then sanctions are introduced, that referrals are made to the UN Security Council um, uh, and, and so on. And it was in the wake of these type of reports that one of the armed forces ministers in the British government said this week that he thought it was likely, i.e. This, this is one of their next moves, that the International Criminal Court would put out <coughs> an arrest warrant for the Syrian president uh, on, on, the, on the basis of, of these kind of things. So it, it's just... Um, I'll leave that point for now, but just with a plea, you know, that when, you know, read things critically um, and look at them closely, look at where, you know, what they actually prove and what they don't, where they come from, and who benefits from them. Um, now, as I said, that uh, these protests in, in, some, in some of these countries that there may be some reasons for, for sections of the population <coughs> to be estranged from their government. Now, in the case of Syria, Syria for many years, for decades, had what I will call an essentially socialist-oriented economy. Namely, it was one in which the state played the dominant role in the service of, of national development. But as in a number of other countries in the Middle East, Asia and Africa, and again, Hapal referred to this in the case of Libya, Relentless pressures in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the countries of Central and Eastern Europe have, over, over time, forced a certain retreat from this. In particular, in 2006, the Syrian government finally accepted an IMF plan that imposed austerity measures, a wage freeze, opened the economy to foreign banks, 
and privatised a substantial number of previously state-run enterprises. And predictably, this led to increased unemployment and inflation alongside deteriorating social conditions, whereas on the other hand, a small number of people were greatly enriched, including some with close ties to the ruling circles. However, it's at least equally important to point out that besides these new government policies, there are other reasons for the present economic difficulties in Syria, the blame for which cannot be laid at the door of Damascus, and I'll highlight a couple of these briefly. Firstly, like many other countries in the third world, the country has been badly hit by the dramatic global rise in, in food prices, and particularly in the case of Syria, as in the, the case of countries in North Africa, by the suspension of grain exports by Russia and the Ukraine, which were traditionally the major suppliers of grain to many Arab states, following the severe droughts and the resultant uh, devastating fires in those countries. In the Syrian case, these woes were compounded by a severe water shortage, uh, due at least in part to the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights since the June 1967 war, <coughs> which was a major source of water for Syria, as well as the building of dams and the resultant diversion of waters from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which has been carried out by successive reactionary regimes in Turkey. But perhaps the greatest issue has been the refugee burden that Syria has long assumed as a result of the imperialist activities in the region. Since the um, Nakba at the end of the 1940s, when the Palestinian people were driven out of their land and homes by the Zionists, Syria has cared for more than 500,000, more than half a million Palestinian refugees and their descendants. And it's also worth noting here that their conditions of life are better than in any surrounding country, because unlike in Lebanon and Jordan, for example, health care, education and housing are all accessible to Palestinians in Syria. Besides the question of the Palestinian refugees in Iraq, the massive US invasion, oh, in Syria, I mean, the massive US, in, besides this, the massive US invasion and destruction of neighboring Iraq um, and the harsh sanctions that were imposed on Syria after the Iraq war have added uh, to this burden. It's never mentioned when the imperialist media talk about the economic problems in Syria. It's never mentioned that Syria has provided a home to more than one and a half million Iraqis uh, who, have, who, um, have, who have come to Syria uh, <coughs> since the US invasion of Iraq eight years ago. And this is, of course, a huge influx for a country with a, with a population in 2006 of just 18 million. Uh, and according to a, you know, a 2007 report by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, the arrival of 2,000 desperate Iraqis every single day had an extreme <coughs> impact on all facets of life in Syria, particularly on the services offered by the state to all its civilians and all its refugees, uh, with Syria having the highest level of civic and social rights for refugees in the region. For example, other surrounding countries require a minimum bank balance and ban destitute refugees from entering their countries. The, um, it's therefore clear that the main cause of any problems in Syria lies in the direct and indirect <coughs> imperialist pressure placed on the country, be it in the form of military threats occupation of part of the national territory by Israel, economic sanctions, mm -hmm. and the impact of the Zionist dispossession of the Palestinian people, and the imperialist occupation and destruction of Iraq. Yet despite all this, the Syrian government has, compared to many other countries in the region, done a pretty good job in providing for the social, econo social and economic needs and rights of the people. For example, the literacy rate in Syria is 84%, whereas in Egypt, <coughs> let us not forget the world's second largest recipient of US aid after Israel, the literacy rate barely reaches 60%. And according to a publication called the CIA World Factbook, um, and the CIA is, to my knowledge, not a source unduly sympathetic to the Syrian government, <laughs> nevertheless, according to the CIA World Factbook, life expectancy in Syria is 74.69 years, which it breaks down as 72.31 for men 
and 77.21 for women. Now this ranks Syria at 94th, in 94th place out of 222, this 222 being made up of 20, 221 states and territories plus a world average, the world average taking 160th place. Now to put this further into some kind of perspective, this puts Syria, a developing country on the front line of the struggle against imperialism, ahead of four members of the European Union, namely Romania on 109, Bulgaria on 114, Estonia on 118 and Latvia on 122. And if we're to compare Syria with its neighbours, we find it outranking the mega oil rich Saudi Arabia, which takes the 108th position, <coughs> as well as Egypt at 123, Turkey at 126 <coughs> and Yemen at 173. And to continue with the analogy, Russia, after the disastrous restoration of capitalism, has sunk to 162nd place, while the blessings of imperialist occupation leave Afghanistan at 221 out of 222, with an average life expectancy of just 45.02 years. Now, if the, and one can look at um, similar uh, similar statistics are roughly give you roughly the same balance if you look at infant mortality and a, num a number of other indices. Now, if the imperialist destabilization campaign against Syria were to succeed, not only would these and other social gains for the Syrian masses be wiped out, but the whole anti-imperialist struggle in the Middle East would suffer a major blow. Anti-imperialist Iran would lose its only real ally in the entire region, the resistance movements of Hezbollah and Hamas would also be substantially weakened, as Syria, is, is, um, Syria and Iran are, are their main external backers, and much of the Iranian support has, for logistical reasons, uh, to, be tran to, to be transited through, through Syria in any case. Besides which, according to the Chinese news agency, no fewer than 11 Palestinian liberation movements maintain their headquarters in Damascus. Uh, and these include, of course, Hamas, which has played uh, the leading role in the Palestinian resistance in recent years. And furthermore, whilst the United States would doubtless gain further bases in the region if Syria's government were to fall, Russia would lose one of its last two naval bases outside its own country, the other being in Ukraine. Now, as with, again, Hapal talked about the fact that imperialist hostility to Libya didn't begin in the last four weeks, but it began 42 years ago with the overthrow of King Idris. Likewise, imperialist hostility to Syria did not begin with the sanctions that have been imposed by the United States and, and the European Union in the last few weeks. Uh, among the organisations believed to be implicated in the armed opposition to the Syrian government at the moment, Two of the key ones, the Syrian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood and an organisation called Hizb Tahrir, which is, or, uh, translates as the Party of Liberation, have both been headquartered in London uh, for decades and both are widely assumed, as with the um, organisations that Harpal mentioned, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group uh, and the National Salvation Front of Libya, both of them are demonstrably have numerous ties with imperialist intelligence services. So, uh, and MI6 in particular. Needless to say, the United States has been no less implicated in the anti-Syrian uh, campaign than, than Britain, more so in fact. Syria has long been on the State Department's notorious <laughs> so-called list of state sponsors of terrorism, which I like to call the State Department list of supporters of national liberation, and it has been one of the pretexts under pretexts under which Syria has been subject to crippling sanctions, not just in the last four weeks, but for many years. Indeed, such has been the extent of US sanctions on Syria that the BBC online recently reported that Western governments were, quote, struggling to find levers to put pressure on Damascus in terms of further sanctions, i.e. it was actually difficult to find ways of tightening them. Um, Um, in 2002, to give you another example, the Pentagon, the US Defense Department, published a, 
document called the Nuclear Posture Review. This was supposed to be a secret document, but it was leaked to the Los Angeles Times. And according to this document, Syria is one of seven <coughs> countries against which the United States has actively developed and current plans allowing it to make a nuclear first strike on the country. And the other six countries uh, in this 2002, named in this 2002 document besides Syria were China, Russia, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Iran, Iraq and Libya. On the 6th of September 2007, Syria was the victim of an Israeli air, air strike which the Zionists and the United States claimed destroyed a projected nuclear reactor which was supposedly being built with assistance from the Koreans, although both the Syrian and Korean governments have consistently denied this. And on the 17th of April, the Washington Post, relying on WikiLeaks, revealed important information regarding how US imperialism has long since been funding Syria's right-wing opposition. Part of the newspaper's report reads as follows. The State Department has secretly financed Syrian political opposition groups and related projects, including a satellite TV channel that beams anti-government programming into the country, according to previously undisclosed diplomatic cables. The London-based satellite channel Barada TV began broadcasting in April 2009, but has ramped up operations to cover the mass protests in Syria as part of a long-standing campaign to overthrow the country's autocratic leader, Bashar al-Assad. Barada TV is closely affiliated with the Movement for Justice, for Justice and Development, a London-based network of Syrian exiles. Classified US diplomatic cables show that the State Department has funneled as much as $6 million to the group since 2006 to operate the satellite channel and finance other activities inside Syria. The US money for Syrian opposition figures began flowing under President George W. Bush after he effectively froze political ties with Damascus in 2005. The financial backing has continued under President Obama, even as his administration sought to build relations with Assad. Well, they have a funny way of seeking to do it, I must say, but there you go. Now, so far, attempts to get the United Nations Security Council to condemn and sanction Syria have failed up until now, um, despite the fact that a draft statement was tabled by France, Britain, Germany and Portugal. But even without a UN fig leaf, voices have already been raised for military action. For example, Joseph Lieberman, who is an extreme right-winger who sits in the Senate as an independent but was a, a former Democratic vice presidential candidate. Um, I believe he was a vice presidential candidate to that nice man, Al Gore, and who is an arch-Zionist, has called on the United States to bomb Syria next uh, after Libya. So I'll leave it there uh, just to, to say that uh, we have seen what has happened, as I say, in Yugoslavia, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and now in Libya. We have to draw lessons from history. We have to, to, to sum up experience. Uh, we have to think these things through. We can't cheer on counter-revolution. And then when the imperialists join in and cheer on counter-revolution far more effectively than we can, turn around like Stop the War and say, oh, the situation has changed. Because the situation has developed. It has not changed. Thank you. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did and uh, it's now time for, for me to invite people um, to, to, to make their own contributions and I expect our speakers will want to come back on that.